This podcast was recorded and provided by the National Association of Regional Councils. For more information about NARC, please visit narc.org. Hello, everybody. This is Autumn Campbell, Director of Community Programs with the National Association of Regional Councils. Welcome to the next installment in our solar podcast series for 2013. These podcasts are brought to you as part of the U.S. Department of Energy's SunShot Solar Outreach Partnership. Through this partnership, NARC is working with the International City and County Management Association, the American Planning Association, and ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, to support local governments in increasing solar deployment in their communities nationwide. Today I'm joined by Brian Roth to talk about the recent initiative in Minnesota to mandate the use of solar power in the state's energy portfolio. Brian is the owner of CR Planning, providing land use, energy, and sustainability consulting services to local and state governments for the last 15 years. From 2008 to 2012, he managed the Minneapolis-St. Paul Solar Cities program, and over the last year has worked with dozens of communities in Minnesota to adapt local policies and regulations to enable local solar deployment. He has conducted national trainings on solar energy planning, zoning, and permitting, has written several guides for local governments on energy efficiency and solar development, and is a major contributor to the National APA's forthcoming Planning Advisory Service Report on Solar Energy. Thanks so much for joining us today, Brian. Thank you. So we know there are certainly big changes happening in the Minnesota solar landscape. Can you give us a status update on what's happening? Well, the, the, there are big changes happening in Minnesota, and uh, the current status is, is that the governor has just last week finally signed the legislation that was uh, proposed and debated uh, for uh, endlessly in the, in the, in the legislature. Um, and uh, so we actually have uh, new law and new policies in place, and we are now uh, kind of starting the process of sorting out what it all means. Because, uh, of course, uh, in, the, uh, in the legislative process, uh, there's a lot of changes that happen and a lot of language gets put, put in. And in the end, uh, sometimes people don't quite uh, understand how it how it is to be interpreted in certain circumstances so and and some of the work that is that uh, happens um, legislatively requires additional uh, study and additional findings that have to be undertaken by either the Department of Commerce uh, or the Public Utilities Commission so we're, we're starting that process now of sorting out the legislation but we do have some pretty clear standards by which uh, we are changing the solar landscape in Minnesota uh, and it's a pretty exciting time to uh, to be looking at uh, how we're going to be changing our energy portfolio here. That's great. Um, can you go through a few of the new policies that um, the specific legislation implements? Uh, sure. We we have there's a number of things that were put into the, into the uh, legislative uh, initiative here. The most prominent of which is uh, probably the solar energy mandate or the renewable energy standard that applies to solar energy, which uh, fits actually on top of Minnesota's existing solar energy standard, um, or I'm sorry, existing renewable energy standard, which is being met primarily through wind energy, uh, where utilities have to uh, acquire, depending on which utility is, 25% uh, 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 of their portfolio has to be renewable energy by 2025 or 2020 for uh, some utilities. But the solar energy standard is on top of that, and it is a, a carve out that says the investor owned utilities uh, of which there are four in Minnesota have to acquire a 1.5 percent of their uh, energy uh, generation bought through solar energy by the year 2020 and that is uh, one and a half percent certainly doesn't sound like very much and uh, on the scale of utility generation it really probably isn't that much but it's about 32 times what we have now in terms of solar energy uh, so we're going to be going from approximately 13 megawatts, where we are now in, in our total capacity, to about 450. Um, and that, that may be a little bit bigger, actually, than 450 even. And that's the major part of the legislation that was passed that everybody's talking about. But there are several other pieces, including we, um, we kind of brought our net metering standards up to, up to current best practices um, nationally. Uh, uh, and we also have a landmark piece, I think, of legislation that very few states have adopted thus far, which is the, um, an alternative to net metering called the value of solar uh, tariff, where utilities can um, create a value of solar tariff uh, as, a, as a substitute for their net metering program. It's a, 
they, they get to choose whether they do it or not, but they have to um, make that choice. And then that is a, a process through which the, a little bit longer process where they have to actually analyze with the Department of Commerce um, an appropriate methodology for valuing solar on their system. We also passed a uh, piece of legislation, a solar gardens or community solar um, law similar to Colorado's, which is the uh, kind of the, right now the, the epicenter of community solar projects. And then we have some uh, additional production incentives for solar, uh, specifically most of which are directed at the Minnesota-made solar uh, industry, solar panels and uh, here. So a variety of different things that are included in this. Uh, some of which are uh, interrelated and we're trying to sort through that process about how that all works. Like you said, these are very big changes for the state of Minnesota um, and the solar landscape in Minnesota. You walked us through a little bit of kind of what is happening now, but can you project out a little bit farther and, and tell us, given these new policies, given this new mandate, which drastically increases solar, you know, what, what does happen next? Well, the, the uh, utilities will need to start um, planning to uh, acquire solar energy on a, on a larger scale. One of the things that's going to happen as a result of kind of a combination of the changes in the net metering law and the, uh, and the solar energy standard is that we'll start to see a lot larger scale projects in Minnesota than we have in the past. Um, Minnesota passed one of the probably the first in the nation net metering law back in 1981. And it was really groundbreaking at the time. Um, however, there was a cap on it of 40, 40 kilowatts, which as we now know and we compare across states is, is a tiny, tiny system. And we never made any changes to that net metering law for 30 years. And, and most, most states who have net metering have caps on the individual size of projects that are, you know, one megawatt or two megawatts. And basically what we did was increase um, our cap up to, uh, up to a megawatt to kind of bring it into line with what we're seeing across the nation uh, in regard to net metering. And that will allow a lot larger scale projects to move forward that didn't before. We had a, an interesting phenomenon in Minnesota. Whenever pe people put up a solar energy project, they seem to all be right at 40 kilowatts even though they may have had a lot more room on the roof to put a larger scale system. And we will now see systems more routinely in the hundreds of megawatts, which is kind of what other states are seeing. And that will really bump up and ramp up the, the uh, rate of solar uh, generation in Minnesota. That by itself will. And so we'll see a lot more large scale projects on commercial buildings and also we'll see uh, more kind of solar farm development or solar garden development, depending on how you want to characterize it, where it's a uh, solar development in a, on, a, on a piece of land where there's a, you know, five acres or 10 acres or 15 acres of land that is dedicated to solar panels, which is, from a local government standpoint is a kind of a land use issue that, that they haven't, written, most governments here haven't had to deal with. And so it'll be kind of interesting to see how that process moves forward and, and, uh, and, and works through the local government process. In Colorado, they did have a few glitches in their community garden uh, legislation as they implemented it at the local level because their local governments weren't quite sure what to make of some of these, some of these systems. And, and uh, sometimes there were things, uh, projects that got slowed down dramatically because the uh, local land use law wasn't, uh, wasn't accommodating of the community solar projects. So we have those kinds of things that are coming up that we have to address, um, are going to be a lot more capital flowing into local governments, uh, uh, in, in, I'm sorry, into, into communities to support solar development um, and larger scale systems uh, will be showing up uh, in Minnesota. Great. So considering all of these changes, and you've mentioned um, some other states as well, can you, can you give us an idea about how Minnesota now stacks up against other states in promoting and mandating solar energy adoption? Yeah, well, Minnesota kind of has, has come up to the norm now, and we've adopted a lot of the best practices um, for uh, solar energy uh, uh, development. The, as I noted, the, uh, the net metering um, standard is now probably right about in the middle of where the rest of states are in, in regard to kind of the standards uh, that we are using compared to what other states are using. 
the best practices as articulated in the uh, uh, you know freeing the grid uh, analysis, where where we, we never got a very good grade, we should now be uh, kind of right right in the middle of the pack and and, and getting getting a um, getting recognized as being being in the norm now rather than being behind the curve. Um, on some other issues, we're actually probably a little bit ahead of some states, such as the, uh, the, the there's a lot of bit movement on the community solar or the uh, solar garden kind of concept. Uh, Colorado had been kind of the, the leader in the nation on that, as well as a, a couple other states that have, have also moved ahead and, and with their own versions of that uh, process. Um, and so we're actually probably uh, you know near, near the front of the pack on that. Um, although it'll depend on how the how the regulatory element of that gets put forward, um, when Colorado did their solar gardens legislation, it took about I think two and a half years to kind of wade through the rulemaking process about how it all worked, and we're hoping to avoid some of that and learn from Colorado's experience to to make this uh, process move a little faster, so that we can get some uh, community uh, community solar programs in place. The community solar programs, I should note, are not required uh, by utilities, but they are enabled. And there are several utilities that have expressed an interest in actually putting together some kind of a community solar program, including our largest utility, XL, which is uh, also works in Colorado, so they have some experience with it. So some of the other elements, the um, value of solar is something, again, that we are kind of on the cutting edge of relative to other states. It is a little bit of a um, uncertain process. There are some folks who see value of solar uh, tariffs as being a potential undermining of the net metering standard. Uh, we're hoping that it won't be, uh, but nevertheless, it is. It is a transformation. I think the next um, realm of trying to move from from a net metering uh, mentality, I guess, for distributed generation and solar in particular, to a system that allows the business model of the utility to change a little bit and accommodate solar energy in a more straightforward and um, understandable and well-documented uh, basis on how to integrate these solar systems into utility systems. Great. Well, again, given all of these major changes and the, and the fact that these policies are still um, so new and, and evolving, can you tell us a little bit about how various stakeholders across the state um, are receiving this this new commitment to um, mandating solar energy? Well, we did we did see a lot of uh, stakeholder engagement uh, going on in the legislative process. As I kind of said that I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of uh, a lot of debate uh, about these changes. Um, the and advocacy community and the environmental community were pushing actually for a more aggressive standard. The original House legislation that passed instead of a 1.5% solar energy standard actually had a 4% standard. But there was a lot of pushback from certain, certain segments. In particular, there's a lot of suspicion by large industrial customers about what this means in terms of rate impacts, what this means in terms of reliability of grid, uh, the, the grid and how the new solar development gets integrated into the grid, there really isn't too much uh, risk from those things for reliability or for cost to industrial customers. However, there are, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, on their behalf, and so they, they, were, they wanted to be um, exempted from it. And the legislation that did get passed, in fact, exempted a lot of our large industry from the impacts of this solar development. And for instance, the large taconite um, and uh, ore processing facilities up on the Iron Range in Minnesota uh, were exempted, as were some of the large paper mills and some of the and other very large industries. So they kind of stepped in and really didn't want to have anything to do with this. Also, the municipals, uh, municipal utilities and the co-ops were largely exempted from all of this regulation. Um, again, because they have uh, they, they had a lot of uncertainty about what this meant for them and how they how it would work, and so they did they wanted to be exempted. They were ultimately exempted from the legislation. So we have some parties who are saying, "Don't give this to me," and we have others that are saying, "You know, forge ahead." So, but the bulk of the state, of course, is served by the investor-owned utilities, and that's uh, and those are the ones who will be doing most of the solar work. So we do have some. There's still some controversy about how this 
is being received, and there there were some very uh, grandiose claims and a certain amount of hyperbole about what a one and a half percent standard was going to do to rates. But we'll we'll move ahead and and we'll see what kind of an impact that has. And I and the uh, most of the analyses that have been done show that it, it is a it is a if there is a rate impact, it's one that will be largely swallowed up in the noise of other things that are going on in the utility industry. So Brian, can you tell us what some of the local economic development impacts are of this legislation? Uh, sure. This, is, this was actually initially promoted by the, um, by the Minnesota Solar Energy Industry Association as a job creator uh, legislation. It was the Solar Jobs Bill, I think it was called. And this is a really important element of this bill, especially when you start looking at the local impacts. We tend to think when we talk about the, the value change of solar, put a lot of emphasis on the manufacturing. And we do have uh, solar, pa solar panels were manufactured in Minnesota and a production incentive rebate explicitly directed at that industry. But most of the jobs created uh, through solar development are actually local jobs by contractors, by developers who are working with homeowners and businesses uh, and institutions to actually put uh, solar systems on the, on those properties and on those buildings. So there is a burgeoning industry here in, and uh, one that will really make a difference at the local level in terms of kind of providing some stability for the contractor industry, a new market for them to work in, as well as enabling new companies to start up to do installations across the state. And as those businesses become more efficient and become more practiced at doing installations, the cost will further drop, and it will, uh, along with the panel cost dropping, and it will help create a self-sustaining solar development industry in Minnesota. And that's kind of that's kind of the ultimate goal of all this is getting to the point where we have new systems going up and the the uh, rebate programs and the kind of tax incentives can fade away and we have a self-sustaining program that is uh, that is creating jobs uh, and maintaining jobs and also uh, reaping a local resource that is currently you know, virtually untouched, which is the solar resource in our communities across the state. From a kind of import substitution basis, Minnesota, of course, has no coal. We have no natural gas. We have none of the traditional energy resources. But we do have uh, large amounts of solar resource and uh, as well as a wind resource. Uh, solar is actually our largest, from a technical uh, capacity basis, is our largest resource. And we have almost no generation in the state for solar energy relative to the uh, you know only 13 megawatts out of thousands that are needed. So this is really a economic development standpoint or economic development benefit from two different standpoints, one being creation of local jobs and the other one being substituting the use of a local resource for uh, an out of state uh, or even sometimes out of country resource. That's really exciting, um, and Minnesota certainly isn't the first place you would think of when you think of solar resources, but that is, that is an exciting piece of information. So you know, what can local governments do to help promote these new policies in their communities? Well, and, and that's really an interesting question for those of us who are kind of in the, in the, in the local government planning industry, is that unlike almost any other kind of energy resource, the solar energy resource, when it's developed, happens at the local level. Local governments tend to think of power production as being centralized facilities, you know, coal or gas-fired plants that are somewhere else. Or uh, even in, the, in, in wind energy, uh, you know, large wind farms that, that are kind of uh, outside in the rural areas, but nevertheless are, are being done on, you know, hundreds of megawatts at a time. And unlike those resources, solar energy will, is in, especially in Minnesota, where we don't have, uh, we won't have big centralized, you know, power plants like you see down in the in the desert southwest. Almost all the development is going to happen, you know, at 10 megawatts or under. Um, our biggest solar farm now is a, is that we have one two megawatt farm, and we'll see some more of those which is very large for a solar facility, but it's actually very small in regard to utility scale planning. And so all of the development is going to happen at the local level. And local governments need to be aware that they're going to become, there's going to be a lot more distributed energy production in their communities. And there'll be more demand for this as the prices continue to go down 
and the demand for it, uh, you know, at, for, for the, the interest in individual property owners in developing their solar resource is going to go up. So local governments need to think about this, all of this, as as a new form of development that is coming to their community. Uh, when we talk to local governments about development, everyone thinks about you know commercial development, about industrial development, about housing development. But well, we now have solar development that's going to be happening, and some of that's going to happen on buildings, and some of that's going to happen as a principal use out in undeveloped areas or on brownfields. And that's something that affects local zoning codes, it affects local permitting processes, it affects the planning, the comprehensive planning that local governments do and regional governments do to kind of accommodate this resource that's suddenly going to be tapped. Um, if, you, if you think for a minute about the big oil and gas boom that's happening out in, in North Dakota and what that has done at the local government kind of planning level, well, we have something similar potentially that could happen when we ramp up a solar development strategy as well, is that it changes the way that development occurs in the community and there's new issues that come up. And this is one of those things that communities really need to think about and they need to address the solar resource in their plans. They need to address the solar resource and the solar development potential in their zoning ordinances and their subdivision ordinances, um, as well as in their permitting processes. When, when people come in and ask for building permits, you know, what are the standards you're being asked to use in terms of making sure that these things, that solar development is happening in a way that's consistent with best practices and reasonable and safe, while at the same time allowing people to capture without undue uh, you know, uh, levels of regulation the uh, solar resource on their properties. And this is where there's a lot of opportunities for communities to look to what's already happened in terms of best practices in planning, zoning, and permitting that have been developed by the, uh, by the national labs and by DOE so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's best, best practices out there that they can utilize. There's good examples that, that are in place, and they need to start thinking about their own plans in, 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 in that kind of context. Well, thank you. We know this is certainly a, an exciting time and a time of much transition um, for the state and stakeholders um, and certainly local communities in Minnesota. Um, but we really appreciate you taking the time today, Brian. It's, it's been great talking with you. To learn more about Brian and his team at CR Planning, visit crplanning.com. You can also find out more about the Sunshot Solar Outreach Partnership's work and some of those resources that Brian mentioned at solaroutreach.org or go to narc.org slash solar ops. Thank you to all who are listening today, and again, thank you to Brian for participating, and we look forward to our podcast series exploring more strategies to help you increase solar in your communities. Thank you for listening. For more information about NARC, please visit narc.org.